And your foot may have been on the gas, but he got you here. I promise you that. Con? Con. All right. So we are honored again to have our elder, elder lawyer, coming in and presiding once again over the Shabbat services today. All right. And we're going to get right into it. Do we have our seven brothers for the reading? Seven brothers, let's come on up with your swords in hand. I'm going to put forth the, um, we had a little bit of a disarray. So first of all, disclaimer, we had a quick baptiz baptism, uh, baptism, Yes. right? Baptizing in the form of a baptism for a family this morning. Oh, yes. Brother, where you stand? All right. We have our brother, Brother Turfoy and his family baptized early this morning. Early this morning. All praises due to the Most High. And we have a good news for our brothers and sisters who are on the list because we're going to be ramping up the orientation for those who are already uh, past the orientation. We have a wonderful site that worked out well for us this morning that's not a thousand miles away. Amon? So that is going to be something that's going to work out really well for us. All right. Uh, give me just a quick second here so we can put the podium up. Let's have seven brothers come forward. We'll be picking up in the book of Judges where we left off from last week. At this time, everyone can rise so that we can perform the Shema. Shema Yasha Allah Ahaya Allah Hayanawa Ahaya Akad. 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 Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one. The Lord our God is one. Right. Let's also read the uh, Ten Commandments. We can open up to Exodus 20. And just to clarify for those who are both online as well as those who may be here for the first time, what we just recited was the Shema, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 in Hebrew. When you get the opportunity, read the book of Deuteronomy 6 and 4, which recites, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay. At this time, we're going to read out of the Ten Commandments, which is the constitution of the nation of Israel. You all can repeat. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 1. And the Most High spake all these words, saying, And the Most High spake all these words, saying, I am the Most High thy power. I am the Most High thy power. Which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage. Out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Or any likeness of anything. Or any likeness of anything. That is in heaven above. That is in heaven above. Or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth. Or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Nor serve them. Nor serve them. For I, the Most High, thy power, am a jealous power. For I, the Most High, thy power, am a jealous power. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers. Upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Of them that hate me. Of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them. And showing mercy unto thousands of them. 
that love me, that love me, and keep my commandments, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Most High thy power in vain. Thou shalt not take the name of the Most High thy power in vain. For the Most High will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. For the Most High will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. To keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor. Six days shalt thou labor. And do all thy work. And do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Most High thy power. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Most High thy power. In it thou shalt not do any work. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Most High made heaven and earth. For in six days the Most High made heaven and earth, the sea, the sea, and all that in them is, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Most High blessed the Sabbath day. Wherefore the Most High blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. And hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother. Hallow thy father and thy mother. That thy days may be long upon the land. That thy days may be long upon the land. Which the Most High thy power giveth thee. Which the Most High thy power giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Nor his manservant. Nor his manservant. Nor his maidservant. Nor his maidservant. Nor his ox. Nor his ox. Nor his donkey. Nor his donkey. Nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings. And the noise of the trumpet. And the noise of the trumpet. And the mountain smoking. And the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it. And when the people saw it. They removed and stood afar off. They removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, Speak thou with us, And we will hear, And we will hear, But let not the Most High speak with us, But let not the Most High speak with us, Lest we die, Lest we die. And Moses said unto the people, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, Fear not, For the Most High has come to prove you, for the Most High has come to prove you. And that his fear may be before your faces. And that his fear may be before your faces. That ye sin not. That ye sin not. Amen. Amen. At this time, the seven men that are prepared to read can come up. So we're going to start off in the book of Judges, chapter 8, verse 1. Shall we walk? All right. Judges 8 and 1. And you can, again. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. I'm Brother Julian, reading from the book of Judges, chapter 8, verse 1. And the man of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus? That thou callest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites. And they did chide with him uh, sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grape of Ephraim better than the vintage of uh, Abizer? The Most High had delivered into, into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him. When he had said that, when he had said that, and Gideon came to Jordan and passed over, he and the three hundred men that that were with him faint, yet pursuing them. And he said unto the men of Sukkot, Give, I pray you. Loaves of bread unto the people that follow me, for they be faint. And I am pursuing after Zebah and Zomuna, kings of Midian. 
And the princes of Sakkar said, Are the hands of Zabah and Zamuna now in thine hands, that we should give bread unto thine, unto thine army? And Gideon said, Therefore, when the Most High had delivered Zabah and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. God. Shalom family. Shalom. Shalom. Brother Damien, reading out of Judges, chapter 8, verse 8. And he went up thence to Penuel, and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him, as the men of Sakath had answered him. And he spake also unto the men of Penuel, saying, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now Zabath and Zalmunna were in Kar Karkoth, and their hosts with them. About 15,000 men, all that were left of all the hosts of the children of the east, were there filled an hundred and twenty thousand men that drew the sword. And Gideon went up by that way of them that, dealt, that dwelt in tents on the east of Nobah and Jogbeha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. And when Zabad and Zalmunna fled, he pursued after them, and took the two kings of Midian, Midian and Zabad and Zalmunna, and discomfited all the hosts, and Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle before the sun was up, and caught a young man of the men of Sakaoth, and inquired of him, and he described unto him the princes of Sakaoth, and the elders thereof, even threescore and seventeen men. Go on. Go on. Shabbat shalom, family. Shabbat shalom. shalom. Brother Aaron, reading from the book of Judges, chapter 8, verse 15. He came into the men of Sakaf and said, Behold, Zabah and Zalmunna, with whom he did them bring saying, Are the hands of Zabah and Zalmunna now in thy hands, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city and, thronged, and, and the thorns of the, wild, of the wilderness and the berries, and with them he taught them men of Sakaf. And he beat down the tower of Penu and slew the men of the city. Then said he unto Zabah and Zamuna, What men of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. And one resembled the children of a king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Most High lived, if ye if ye had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jetha his firstborn, Up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was yet a youth. Mm -hmm. Then Zabah and Zamun said, Rise thou, and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and slew Zabah and Zamun and took away the ornaments that were on their camel's necks. Shabbat Shalom, family. Shabbat Shalom. My name is Brother Nassau, tribe of Judah, nation of Israel. I'll be reading from Judges 8, verse 22. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you, that ye will give me every man the earrings of his, that you will give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings, because they were because they were Ishmaelites. 
And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prayer. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian, and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. And Gideon made an ephod thereof, and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither, a whoring after it, which then became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. And the country was in the quietness forty years in the days of Gideon. Shabbat shalom, honey. Shabbat shalom. I am Brother David, reading this morning out of Judges 8, verses 29. And Jeroboam, the son of Josh, went and dwelt in his own house. And Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son, whose name he called Abimelech. Gideon, the son of Josh, died in a good old age and was buried in the scepter of Josh, his father, in Ophrah of the Abizorites. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went on war after Belem and made Baal Beor their, their God. And the children of Israel remember not the Most High their power, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had shown unto Israel. God. God. Two more. Two more? Okay. Judges. Two more men? Two more men. Mm -hmm. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Brother Leon, child of Levi, the nation of Israel, reading out of Judges chapter 9, verse 1. And Abelet, the son of Jehubah, went to Shechem unto his mother brethren and communed with them. And with all of the family of the house of, of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray, I pray you, in the ears of all of the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you either that all of the sons of Jerubbaal, which are three scores and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren spake of him in his ears of all of the men of Shechem. All of these words in their hearts inclined to follow Abram, Abram like, from they said, he is our brother. And they gave him three scores and 10 pieces of silver out of the house of Beal Baren, wherewith Emma me, late, hired vain and light persons which followed him, and went unto his father's house at Ophorim, and slew his brother, Beverin, and the sons of Jehovah, being three scores and ten persons upon one stone. Notwithstanding, yet Joadam, the youngest son of Jehovah, was left. For he hid himself. And all of the men of Shechem gathered it together in all of the house of Milo and went and made Abimelech king by the plains of the pillar that was in Shechem. And when they took, told Salakia, and when they told 
into Jordan, he went and stood into the top of the Mount of Gerizim and lift up his voice and cried and said unto them, hearken unto me, yea, men of Shechem, the most high may hearken unto you. Uh. Brother Arthur, reading out of the book of Judges, chapter 9, verse 8. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my father's world with by me that they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the tree said to the fig tree, Come thou, and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit to go to be promoted over the trees? Mm -hmm. Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou, and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my vine, my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou, and reign over us. God. All right, the water for the reading. All right. Before we go into a selection by the choir, I'm going to ask a question. Does anyone know why, before we start or before we go into the lesson or uh, begin services, uh, we read out of the law, out of the stories of the Old Testament? Does anyone know why? That's part of it. It was a custom, as it tells us in the book of Acts. Uh, Moses of old time had them who read out of the law. That's in the book, the book of Acts. Anything else? Anyone else know why we read these old stories and read out of the commandments? There you go. Okay to remind us of the mistakes that our forefathers made and to remind us of the Most High's law. Okay? And there's a few things I want to go into just to cover this so that we know the mindset to have as we go into these stories. Because sometimes it can just seem like, you know, just jargon, just old stories and, you know, it's boring, don't really relate to us. But we're going to find out that these stories are the foundation of the gospel. And without these stories, without this history, without the law, we really don't have a, a, a context, an historical context of where Christ was coming from with the gospel. Okay? So a few scriptures just to explain so that going forward, and I'm pretty sure we, you know, most of us have this mindset as we're reading these stories, but just to put it out there in the atmosphere so that we understand. Let's get a few references. Let's start in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4. Okay. In fact, before we go there, let's start in the Old Testament. Let's get two scriptures from the Old Testament. Let's get Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 7, as well as Job, chapter 8, verse 8. Deuteronomy 32 and 7. 32 and 7. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Right. 
So first and foremost, the Bible within the law states, remember the days of old. Now it's commonly taught us in this society what? Forget the past. Okay? And especially with us, anytime we bring up the oppression and the slavery that has happened towards us, one of the first things people say is what? Forget the past. But then we turn it back on them. We ask them, okay, if it's about forgetting the past, how about we forget what happened on 9 11? But here it is, every year they got a what? A 9 11 commemoration. Okay, if it's about forgetting the past, let's forget what took place during the Holocaust. Yet every other minute they have a what? A new Holocaust movie. Okay? So for us, they tell us to forget the past, but for them, they commemorate their sufferings. They remember their sufferings. Well, brothers and sisters, no longer do you have to accept that as some type of guilt trip to make you believe that you're wrong for remembering what happened to you. Okay? The Bible says, remember the days of old and the years of many generations. Okay? And this is the mindset we have as we go into the old stories of our forefathers and go into the laws. We're remembering those days of old. Okay? Read on. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Okay? So we used to be able to ask our fathers based on the history that was passed on from generation to generation. Okay? Our fathers would pass these stories down, going back to the time of Adam, and give us the history of what happened in the prior times, the prior generations. Okay? But now a majority of our fathers don't have this knowledge. So the question is, how do we ask our fathers now about the time of many generations, the days of old? Huh. It's right here in the Bible. Okay? Every time we go into that Torah, or we go into the first five books of Moses, we're approaching our fathers, and we're asking our fathers about what took place in the days of old. Anytime we read the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, we're going before our fathers, we're approaching the records of our fathers, and we're asking them for answers of the past. Okay? What happened in your time? How did we, as a future generation, how did your generation affect us? Okay? These are the questions that are answered when we approach the records of our fathers. Okay? Read on. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. Read on. Verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. All right, so let's hold that. Let's go to the book of Job 8 and 8. Book of Job, chapter 8, verse 8. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to search, to the search of their fathers. Right, so again, the Bible is instructing us to inquire, meaning to ask, to be inquisitive about the former age, meaning the past times, the days of old, and to prepare ourselves to the search of our fathers. Okay? Again, our immediate fathers, meaning our biological fathers, a majority of them, don't have this knowledge. Okay? And it's a shame. But nonetheless, the Most High was wise and was merciful enough to allow us to have a record such as the Bible to where the history of our forefathers could be compiled. And we could easily just go back, open up the records, and inquire, search. Okay. Read on. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing. See, we know nothing. We think that because technology has increased and all the wisdom is accessible immediately, we think we know everything. 
But the reality is that the majority of information that we're able to access so quickly is frivolous, vain knowledge. Okay? The greatest knowledge that we could ever find in our lives is the knowledge contained within the pages of his Bible. Okay? This is the greatest knowledge that any man or woman could ever find in their life. Okay? Why? Because it gives us, even though it's about the former age, and you hear this quite often, you hear in Christianity, don't read the Old Testament. Okay? Those are just old stories, and it's bloody, and it's war, and all these different things. It's legalistic. These are all the things you hear from religion. Okay? But here it is. The Bible is telling us something different. The Bible is telling us to go into the Old Testament. Why? Because the mistakes that our forefathers made in their time can help us make decisions on how to make the proper choices in our time. And on the flip side, vice versa, the good decisions that our forefathers made in their time can help us make wise decisions in our time. Okay? So it is very important for us to know this history. Okay? Now, I'm going to give a few examples. We're not going to go there because they're long chapters. Okay? But let me ask you, do any of you have a example, an example, in the New Testament, of those who would reflect on the Old Testament. Anyone? Christ would often say, as it is written. He would often refer to the Old Testament. After he was crucified, he did what with his disciples? He went from the book of Moses, to the, or the, the law, the books of Moses, and the Psalms concerning himself. Okay? So Christ used the Old Testament. Okay? Who else? The Apostles. The Apostle Paul. Okay? He would often refer to what? The Old Testament. Why? Because the Old Testament gave us context concerning not only our forefathers, but it gave us context to the Gospel. These people who were in the Old Testament are the people that the Most High is sending his Apostles to to save in the New Testament. Okay? When you uh, remember Stephen or Stephen, before he was killed, he did what? He recited the history of the Old Testament. Okay? So the Bible is filled with examples, both in the Old and New Testament, which tell us that it is important for us to know our biblical history. Okay? One last scripture, the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4. Then after this, we're going to bring in the choir for their first selection. When you dare say come, the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Exactly. So the things that were written aforetime, meaning in the ancient times, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So the question is, how can we have comfort from reading the things of old? How is that possible, anyone? How does that bring us comfort and patience? Anyone? We have faith, but how do we obtain that faith? What does reading the old Stories, how does that give us faith that the most I will save us? We see that our ancestors went through that once and us. We see how they overcame. You're 100% correct. We read the examples of our forefathers who went through the same exact things that we go through today, and sometimes even worse. Okay? I mean, back then, things were a little bit more harsh than they are today. Today, we have the illusion of democracy and freedom. Back then, that didn't exist, okay? When you did certain things, judgment was expedient, 
Okay? So our forefathers went through a lot. But through patience, they overcame. Through faith, they overcame. And those are the examples we see when we go and we read these same exact stories. Okay? So that's the patience and the comfort and the hope that we receive from Scripture. Okay? Not one time in the Bible do we see someone who put their faith and trust in the Most High and was forsaken. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. It doesn't exist. Now, did they go through pain and suffering and persecution? Absolutely. Okay? In the physical, yes. But we know the Most High, through His mercy and His wisdom, gave us something called what? The resurrection. Everlasting life. So they may have suffered in this life, but in the life to come, man, they will be the next leaders of the world to come. And of their kingdom, there will be no end. Okay? So these are the examples we have. So I just want to put that out there so next time, you know, if you already have that mindset when reading the stories, that's beautiful. But next time when we read the stories, just keep that in mind and try to find, you know, answers in those stories. Try to find reflection in those old stories. Come? Come. All right. At this time, we're going to bring in the choir, and the choir will perform their first selection. And then afterwards, we'll get into the lesson. Before we get started, we just want to give all praise, all praise. Going to the most high. All praise. 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 All Step forward a little bit. Step forward. Yeah. In direct line of Okay. Maybe I see. You're good like that. Sorry about that. Release your voices in here. Yeah. 
There's beauty in my brokenness. I've got true love instead of pain. There's freedom, though you captured me. I've got joy instead of mourning. Yeah. I've got true love instead of pain. Freedom. There's freedom, so you captured me. I've got joy. I've got joy instead of mourning. For you give me joy. Now deep in my soul. Yeah. Now deep in my soul. Now deep. Now deep in my soul. Give me joy down deep in my soul. Yeah. Down deep in my soul. Down deep yeah. in my soul. Come on, cry. There's beauty in my brokenness. I may got true love. I got true love instead of pain. There's freedom. There's freedom for oh, you captured me. I've got joy. I got joy. So free, caught in your love for me. You love me. I've never been more secure, knowing your father. So I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Down deep in my soul. Yeah. Sabbath. Everyone good? Yeah. All right. All right. Let's praise the Father for that. All right. So, the title for today's lesson is Unwavering and Fearless. Okay. Unwavering and Fearless. All right. How many of you know how it feels to waver? In faith. All right. 
How many of you know how it feels to have fear? These are all things we deal with in this walk. We know that, of course, this is not a sprint, but a what? A marathon. And in this marathon, there's so many hurdles, there's so many, you know, so many things that we fight through just to try to make it to the finish line. Sometimes it can cause us to waver. We get complacent, we get stressed, we get upset, we get angry, and also, we become fearful. We're looking at not only what's taking place in the earth, around us, what's commonly being reported, what's being broadcasted. We're also looking at ourselves. And sometimes we ask ourselves, am I worthy? Why me? I know, you know, the things that I've done in the world Man, Lord, what, what made you choose me to hear this word and receive it? And sometimes we get so down on ourselves and so hard on ourselves, we start second-guessing and, and questioning our calling. Okay? We fall, we backslide, and with that comes fear. Because after you backslide, you now start questioning, Lord, is it possible for, for me to come back or to bounce back from this fall? We start becoming fearful. So now everything that is reported on the news, prophecy, wars and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence, we become fearful of those things because of all the things we've done, we now start to question, Lord, is this what will befall me? Will this befall me because I've fallen back and because I feel I'm not worthy? Lord, will I have to go through these things? So we become fearful. Okay? Now, hopefully, through the process of this lesson, we'll open up understanding through the power of the Holy Spirit to show us where that fear comes from and that spirit of wavering comes from, and also how to overcome. Okay? Come? Come. All right. So, we're going to start off with the introduction here, just so that we can get into the full spirit of what the lesson is about and the spirit of the spirit that we want to try to relay, and then we'll get right into it. You can read that, Father Baruch. Unwavering and fearless. Our media pushes fear through false flags, movies, news, and other forms of satanic media outlets. We end up getting so surrounded by lies and theatrics that even in the truth, it can become a bit overwhelming for some and panic occurs. We must not allow the devil, who is a master of illusion, to shake us with his pawns he uses to paint a narrative of hopelessness as there is nothing that was not already foretold by the Father and things are on course as he told us ages ago. Mm -hmm. Let's look to our word which has foretold us of this very time so that we can become unwavering in our walk and steadfast. All right, so everyone got that, huh? Uh -huh. All right. Now, I'm going to mention a few things before we get into it because it mentions something very key about false flags and, and movies and so on and so forth and how these things are actually used by Satan to keep us in the spirit of fear, okay, to cause us to waver in faith. All right. What is one of the most recent false flags that we all can remember? And I know that we all are ranging from different ages, so on and so forth. Some of us may have seen different things in the past, but what is the one thing that we can all remember that we're reminded of from year to year? 9-11. Okay. Now, of course, everyone and their mother knows now that what? 9-11 was an inside job. Uh, right? Everyone parrots that and repeats that. Everyone knows that. But who remembers when 9-11 first happened? How many of you knew when it first happened it was an inside job? <laughs> I know I didn't. Okay? If you did, you were, you were blessed. <laughs> but when it first happened, we were all looking 
and shock and awe. Mm -hmm. Like, why would someone do such a monstrous, atrocious attack on America? We were all in fear to some degree. What's going to happen next? Mm. Is it going to be my school? Mm. Is it going to be my mother's workplace, my father's workplace? Mm -hmm. Okay. Where are they going to attack next? So it put us in the spirit of fear. Mm. Now, here's the question. What did that spirit of fear impose upon us? Exactly. Because we were so fearful of what took place and didn't know where it came from, why it happened, who did it, or what have you, it allowed us to allow the government to start imposing certain things on us, restrictions. So here it is in 20, yeah, Janda? Give an excuse to go to war, too. An excuse to go to war, of course, as always, but. Here's the thing. They're telling us that they're looking for what? Ninth, what was it? 19 Arabs. Anyone remember the storyline? So long ago. 19 yeah. Arabs with box cutters. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Getting through the toughest security on the face of the planet. Hijacking planes with no experience. Passports not being burnt. Passports not being burnt. Now we all can make a joke. Listen, if you can make a passport that can make it through this catastrophe, I need a suit like that. Okay? Whatever material you use for those passports, build my house like that. Okay? Build a plane like that. Okay? <laughs> exactly. plane like that. okay? But nonetheless, through that story, no matter how heinous it was, okay, it now imposed certain things on us. Here it is. You're talking about a guy, uh, Osama bin Laden, okay? Somewhere what they were promoting in the caves of Ad Afghanistan. Mm. He's public enemy number one. The question is this. If you're looking for a guy in a cave, why are you imposing things on me here in America? Why is it now in 2018 when I go through the airport, I got to go through a body scanner, able to x-ray and see everything of my, you know, you know, those secret places. You know, radiating, microwave, okay? And of course, do not go through the scanner. All right, when you go through, or when they, when they, you know, it's your time to go up, say, I opt out. They'll put you to the side, oh, you got to opt out, no opt out. Make you feel like a criminal. Okay, and hey, I'll play the part of a criminal. I'll look like a criminal, but I'm not going through that microwave. Okay, so let them pull you to the side. It may take a few minutes for someone to come and pat you down, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Still, you're saving yourself, you're sparing your health from having to go through that radiation, mm -hmm. okay? But nonetheless, these are the things that have been imposed on us, spying through the Patriot Act, telling us that we have to listen to everyone's phone calls and conversations. We have to do surveillance on American citizens based on what was done by someone in a desert, okay? Now, I use that as an example to show you how vulnerable we become to Satan and his vices through fear. And one of the biggest mediums that Satan uses to put us in fear is what? Anyone? I heard someone say news. News, movies, in other words, under the broad spectrum of what? Entertainment, Entertainment television. Okay? And the Bible tells us of this. Let's get the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Okay? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. In fact, start in verse 1. Okay. The book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit, that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Right. The spirit, or the, the, according to this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So in the Bible, Satan is called what? The prince of the power of the air. 
okay? And one of the largest, greatest mediums that Satan would use to convey messages to either convince you of sin, that sin is normal, it's the popular thing to do, it's the end thing, or to impose you with fear. One of the greatest, greatest mediums he would use is the airwaves. At one time it was radio. Now it's television. Now it's the internet. Okay? So the Bible told us of this. So we, we have to be careful as to what we allow in our temple from Satan's airwaves. Okay? Understanding that anything we allow in our temple has the potential to shape our thoughts, to shape our actions, to shape our walk. Okay? And it has the potential to cause us to waver and have fear. Okay? So, starting off in our lesson, we're going to go to the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 16. Okay? Matthew 19 and verse number 16. When you're there, say, God. Book of Matthew, chapter 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Right, so we're all familiar with this story, huh? All right, who is speaking to Christ at this time? The rich young ruler, okay? So he's asking Christ, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Read on. And he said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, the Most High. Right, so Christ was giving all praise and honor to the Father in heaven. Read on. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. But if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. Okay? So there's no possible way to enter into eternal life to enter into the good old kingdom of heaven that everyone is preaching about. Okay? But yet, don't want to do the very thing that Christ said we must do to enter into life. Mm -hmm. To enter into the kingdom. Which is keep God's commandments. Okay? And today, just by being here, you're doing what? You're keeping one of those commandments, which is what? Honor the Sabbath to keep it holy. Okay? Read on. Verse 18, he saith unto him, which, Yeshua said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. So the man said, which commandment shall I keep? And Yeshua said, thou shalt do no murder, meaning you shall not commit murder. Thou shalt not what? Commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Go ahead. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Read on. Honor thy father and thy mother. Honor father and mother. Go ahead. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So if you were to sum up all of those commandments that Christ just recited, those commandments are what? The ten. The ten commandments. Okay? So in other words, Christ says, honor and keep the ten commandments. All right? If you do those you shall enter into life. Okay? All the other commandments are now a, a springboard, so to speak, or an addition to those commandments. Okay? Showing us how to live civilly once, one amongst another. Showing us how we should honor our temples and keep our temples clean through what? The dietary law. Okay? So those are just an extension of the ten. Okay? Read on. Verse 20. The young man saith unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What like I ye yet? Right, so now, the young man says, or the young rich ruler says, all of these things I've kept up from my youth. Okay? Because this was the law amongst Israel. These were things, this was second nature. You were supposed to keep these commandments. Okay? But did anyone notice anything about the question that he asked? Mm-hmm. He asked, what must I do? But why is he asking this question? Because if he's keeping these commandments, okay, you don't have to ask the question. 
So what does this young rich ruler know? He knows that there's something he must do outside of just the Ten Commandments to receive life. God. So now he's asking the question, mm -hmm. Lord, what shall I do? Okay. I did all of, all, of, all of those commandments for my youth. What else do I lack? Now, normally, if he knew that that was the way to go, he could have easily just walked off and said, hey, I keep the Ten Commandments. All right, hey, I'm going to enter into life. Hmm. But he knew there was more. There was something missing. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what was missing? Verse 21. Verse 21. Yeshia said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, read on, go and sell thou that that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And come and follow me. And when Christ gave that response, the rich young ruler heard the one thing that he did not want to hear. Hmm. Why? Because as we'll read, he knew it was his money that kept him from entering into life. His riches. Okay? So when he heard this response, let's see how he responded to Christ. Because remember, he's asking how to enter into life. He wants to know. Christ gave a response, keep the commandments. He said, what else? Christ says, sell all you have and give it to the poor. How does he respond? 22. Verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Okay? A very rich man. All right? So now when he received this response and understood that Christ confirmed what he knew, he knew that it was his riches that kept him from entering into life. Mm -hmm. Okay? But he wanted someone to, you know, make him feel good, give him a good conscience. Mm -hmm. Okay? He wanted an answer that can go along, as the Bible says, itching ears. Okay? Smooth things. Mm -hmm. Tell me what I want to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay? But Christ, again, he told him the one thing he did not want to hear. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he went away sorrowful. Now, for us, because everyone is not rich, okay? Yeah. But for us, there's different vices that we have. Mm -hmm. Just like this rich man. It may not be money, mm -hmm. but it may be something else that's keeping you back from entering into life. And you know you must give it up. And you go to the Father, you pray, you know what that thing is. Mm -hmm. But you want the Father to confirm in your spirit what you, you know, to make you feel good. Father, tell me something smooth. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. Tell me I don't have to give up this thing that I desire and I love so much. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the Father keeps showing you examples. He keeps putting on, on your spirit to let you know. Put it down. down. That thing is going to keep you from entering into life. And you just... Can't be it. That's the devil. <laughs> something you gotta else. Say, that's something else. else. Right? Mm. You know it's the most high speaking to you. You know the Holy Spirit is, is conferring with you and letting you know what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Verse 23. Then said Yeshua unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right, so Christ says a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, is it impossible? No. But it is very, very hard. Why? Because their money becomes their God. Their money becomes their God, as Christ said what? There are only two masters. You will either serve one and hate the other, or love one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Mammon. Mammon. That's right. Okay? What else did Christ say about riches? He says that they are the root of all evil, yes. What else? Where your heart is, your treasure shall be also. Okay? But what about the parable of the sower? What did Christ say in the parable of the sower about riches? They're the thorns. But what word did he use to describe them? The D word. Deceitful. Okay. 
He says in that parable, the deceitfulness of riches come up and they choke the word and the word becomes unfruitful. Because those riches deceive you. Okay? They make you believe. Well, listen, I got everything I need here. I'm comfortable. Y'all remember that, that parable about the, uh, what was he, a farmer in the scriptures? Mm -hmm. Who had the great resources, he had cattle and fruits, and it was time for harvest. And he says, man, I got so much substance, I don't know where to put this stuff. Let me go ahead and make a barn and you know, put all my stuff in the barn, and I'll sit back and I'll be comfortable. Mm -hmm. It deceived him. How? Because little did he know that the Most High required his soul that very night. And then what happens to all of his substance, all of his riches, all of his wealth? You can't use it now. Can't buy your way into the kingdom. Okay? And many people come with that mindset. Like, listen, I can buy my way into God's kingdom. Okay? It is impossible. All right? But getting back to the point, because there's a greater point we want to go into uh, on this uh, particular chapter. Uh, let's read on verse number 24. Verse 24. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of the Most High. Mm -hmm. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? He said, man, who can therefore be saved? This, this road, this, this path into the kingdom, this thing seems impossible. I don't think anyone can make it back past that finish line. Because what's required of us, man, is it bearable? But what did Christ say? Read on. Verse 26. But Yeshua beheld them, and said unto them, With men, this is impossible. With men, this is impossible. Just through flesh and blood, entering into God's kingdom is impossible. Just through your own mind, your own education, your own intelligence, entering into the kingdom is impossible. God. Okay, but what? But with the Most High Ahaya, all things are possible. But with the Most High, all things are possible. Okay? And this is the one message that we must realize. Sometimes, because we're dealing with unwavering, and what else? Fearlessness. Mm -hmm. Okay? So sometimes when we get ourselves in situations where we're finding ourselves wavering in faith, or we're becoming fearful, what's the first mode of action we take? We start trying to go into our own mind and we start trying to work it out ourselves. And you understand, we don't, the, the first nature of man is not to seek something outside of himself. Our first nature is to try to do it by our own will and our own power, our own might. When we can't do it by our own will, power, and might, it's impossible. Okay? Christ has proved it to us that it is impossible just by our own might. Even the Son of God had to do what? He had to pray. He had to fast. He had to stay in constant conversation with the Father. Okay? And that's the example that he left us. So we, in turn, must understand, in order to overcome anything, fear, wavering, lack of faith, anything that we come up against in this earth, the only way to overcome is what? Praying. Fasting. Staying in constant conversation with the Father. Okay? Because it's his spirit that gives us strength and power to overcome anything. He says, if we have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, we should be able to do what? Mountains. Move mountains. Now, we can't move mountains by ourselves with our own mind. You can sit there all day and try to meditate on the mountain and stare at it. That mountain ain't going to do anything. Okay? Only with the most size it possible. Okay? Let's go to Matthew 14 and 23. Uh, you, can, you can read it. Yep. Okay. Right. Getting to the commentary as you turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 23. Even though in this particular, this was a discussion on who would be able to possibly enter the kingdom on another level, there is a deeper understanding. 
which needs to be explored. Christ Yeshua understood that the seemingly impossible is in fact possible if you operate within the Father's will. Let's look first at Christ and an example of what the world would claim is impossible. All right. The book of Matthew, chapter 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed. Let's make sure I'm right. Shall I hear? Verse 24. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Yeshua went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Right. So they saw Christ walking upon the sea, and they thought it was some type of spirit coming towards their, their ship. So they cried out with fear. Okay. Verse 27. Verse 27. But straightway Yeshua spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Read on. And Peter answered him, and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. So, Lord, if it's you and you have the power to walk on water, Lord, give me that same power. Hmm. Read on. Verse 29. And you have to understand the water, and of course, this was the, you know, amongst the mythological, philosophical nations. The waters in ancient times, to, for some nations, was worshipped as a god because it was so fierce. It was like a parable for the unknown. Because you look out, if you ever looked out onto a sea, you look at the horizon, and it looks like it goes on forever. Mm -hmm. So this, this water for ancient cultures was like just a concept of the unknown. So unknown that they began to worship it in falsehood as a god. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it was like a concept of being able to conquer and overcome the fear of dealing on this sea and dealing with the fierceness of it. That was powerful. Okay? Read on. Verse 29. And he said, Come. And when Peter so was Christ said, Come. You have the power to do so. Hmm. Read on. And when Peter was come down out the, of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Yeshua. So he got out the ship and he walked on the water to see Christ. So when he listened to Christ, instead of his own mind, his own spirit, his own might, he was able to do what? Walk on water. Mm. Which is what? Seemingly impossible. All right? How many of you ever tried to walk on water? <laughs> How many of you achieved it? It seems impossible, right? <laughs> but with Christ, with the Most High, all things are possible. And he showed that to Peter. Okay? But we're going to show you what prevented Peter from going through with the impossible. Go ahead. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. When he saw the wind was boisterous, he became afraid. Okay? You know, how many of you have ever been, and I think the closest things I, I can compare this to is a, a, a flight. I've never been on a ship. How many of you have ever been on a ship and it, you know, you get that, that turbulence? Okay. It's one of the scariest things in the world. Okay, I mean, the last flight I came from Atlanta, it was a storm, and brothers and sisters, if mm -hmm. faith had to kick in, it was at that time. God. Because it was probably one of the worst flights I've ever been in in my life. Mm. Okay, it is a very scary thing to be in an unknown situation that you have no control over. And you got to just trust in the most high that he's going to allow you to make it to the other side. Okay. So imagine you're walking on water. You don't know how deep the water is. And you know how Jake is when it comes to swimming. All right? Sometimes, you know, I don't know, maybe this is the South, y'all, you know, y'all good with it, but us city boys, when it comes to swimming, man, we're a little, you know, standoffish when it comes to that. So you got Peter here, he's a Jake, and he's out there in the deep blue sea, don't know how deep the water is, and he got to walk across this water, and all of a sudden he feels this great wind come across. And with that wind, he became fearful. 
Now, <laughs> it's natural, it's normal for us to understand why he became fearful, but did not Peter a few moments ago just get word from Christ that you have power to walk on this water? So the question is, why become fearful? Christ just confirmed that you have the power to make the impossible possible. Why do you still possess fear? And this is what Peter had to face. He had to face that fear right, you know, head on. Okay? So let's see what Christ said as a response of Peter now taking on that spirit of fear and now beginning to sink into that water. Okay? Read on. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Isaiah stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did you doubt? I just gave you the confirmation. I just gave you the power. Why have you doubted me? So many of us at this time, if you can, just reflect on those situations that you've been in. But Christ has confirmed you have the power to overcome, but yet you second-guessed. You allow fear to get in the way of what Christ and the Most High have confirmed on your spirit that you have power to do. Just reflect on those situations. Okay? What thoughts were running through your mind when you allowed that fear to come in? What spirit did Satan put on you to cause you to forsake and forget the confirmation that the Most High have put in you. Absolutely. Okay? It all boiled down to fear. All right? So when we're in those situations, we can always reflect, as we read earlier, the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we can reflect and see that with the Most High and Christ, when they confirm something and they, they put it in our spirit, we have to go through with it. No matter how fearful it may seem, no matter how fearful it may become, no matter how strong that wind is, mm -hmm. you got to overcome. Okay? you got to get through it. All right? So that's what Christ was showing to Peter. And it was important for Peter to understand the power of faith. Why? Because Peter would be the disciple upon whom Christ built his church. So if anyone needed faith, if anyone had to understand perseverance, it was Peter. Okay? Read on. Verse 32. And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of the Most High. So that for them was a testimony and a witness that he was the Son of God. They needed no more confirmation. This was the God prophesied in the Old, the Old Testament to come and be a sacrifice for our sins. Okay? You can read the commentary before we move on. We all know the story, but how many of us continue to fall when things get rough and we are expected to stand on our faith? The Father needs us to understand that there is nothing in this earth that he is not in control of, including the devil. Mm. We must begin to look at things with the eyes of Christ. Christ created the seas through the authority of the Father, so he understood the water was to do whatever he said or believed it would do. Our minds must eventually make the type of leap of faith, understanding the authority of whom we are represented. Mm -hmm. So we're representing the Father, so we must walk in the authority that the Father gives us, in other words. So everyone understands that, huh? Uh -huh. All right, let's jump over to Matthew 24 and 4, down to verse number 14. When you're there, say come. The book of Matthew, chapter 24, picking up at verse 4. And Yeshua answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Right, so what is Christ uh, revealing here to his apostles? What is he showing them? The prophecies of what in particular? 
in times. Let's go to verse 3. The book of Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Mm -hmm. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? When shall these things be? Read on. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Read on. And of the end of the world. And of the end of the world. So this is what Christ is showing to his apostles. Okay? When shall Jerusalem fall? What shall be the sign of thy coming? And what shall be the end of the world? So now Christ is revealing it. Okay, he's giving revelation. So let's read verse number four or five again. Verse five. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Right. So many have come in Christ's name, saying they are Christ. They are representatives of Christ. They are followers of Christ. And in doing so shall deceive many. Who is this referring to? Modern day Christianity. Okay? Using the name of Christ to bring Babylonian deception. Okay? Read on. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Right. So... Let's run it down real quick. I'm pretty sure many of you watch the news, right? You see the news daily. And often when you watch the news, what are you hearing about constantly? War. Okay? You're hearing about America and their possible, you know, conflicts with Russia and North Korea and China, Iran. You're hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Second question. What is the first response or the first emotion you feel when you're hearing about these wars naturally you feel fear because you're thinking where do i fall in all this how will this affect me because we know with war it ain't just people somewhere in a desert somewhere in a foreign land that you don't know about hmm. and they're just fighting and you know you're just seeing these things take place on television War is, is a great phenomenon that we can only imagine how it affects us on this side of the earth. Okay? And as the Bible prophesied with this last war, okay, this final war with Iran, it tells us that America will not be successful in this war. They will not be successful. Okay? It says the Medes, once they shoot their arrows, which is the ancient verbiage for missiles, this place is in bad shape. Okay, let me make this clear for the camera. We are in no way, shape, or form supporting Iran. Why? Because we know after America falls and Iran gets a little power, what have you, Iran will fall. Okay? All of this right now is the Mosai's chessboard. The Mosai's playing chess with the nations, using one against another to destroy one another. And when they're all dilapidated and crushed and you know, they're going, they're licking their wounds and recovering from one war. He's putting them in another war until he comes back and he brings the final war. And the final war, it tells us what? That the saints shall take the kingdom and they shall reign forever, even forever and ever. And of their kingdom, there shall be no end. Okay? So... America and the Western world powers, they're, they're in for some trouble, okay? But nonetheless, again, the first feeling we receive, Salaki, receive naturally is what? Fear. Because we're wondering, what happens if they now start shooting missiles and we're still here? What happens when now gas prices go up and food prices go up based on the oil and all those different things that will be affected through warfare? How does that affect us? So we become fearful. And then we had hey, we to get out of here. Well, so I told you, man, I got to leave. Mm -hmm. I saw it in a dream last night. <laughs> I said, I got to get out of here, man. And then you come to the elders and we say, be patient. We're working. We're going to, you know, we're doing some things. Just be patient. Build, build. Uh, most I said, I, I saw it in a dream last night. This week. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to leave this week. I got my passport. got my kids' passports. Be out of here. <laughs> right? That's the first thing we get into. Not because the Most High told us we have to leave, but because what? We're in fear. So why not just be honest and say, 
you know, elder, a deacon, <clears throat> I'm seeing what's taking place, and I can't, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I know I'm in the truth, and I'm, I'm very fearful of what's going to take place. If you're honest in that regard, then you have brothers and sisters who can help rebuild your faith, rebuild your strength, to cast out that spirit of fear. But when you come sideways, the most I show me. Mm. Who, who can trump that? Hey, the most I showed you, what, what can I do? I can't help you with that. Okay? But if you come in honesty, you have people who can help you overcome what you're battling with. Okay? When it comes to fear. All right? Read on, uh, verse 7. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Mm -hmm. And there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. Right. So we know these things are destined to take, take place because what? They're prophesying. Okay, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places, meaning different places. Read on. Verse 8. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Mm-hmm. And then shall many... So check that out. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Mm. Now remember, we're talking... Christ is speaking to who? His apostles. Okay? So these men were there from the time that Christ was baptized up into his crucifixion. These were true followers of Christ. But yet it's telling us that these true followers of Christ, the men who follow his message and the women who follow his message... message shall be delivered up to be afflicted, meaning tortured, and they shall kill you. So this is the true, I guess you would say, destiny of those who follow Christ. So what are they talking about in the churches where they tell you that, you know, you don't have to go through anything, this, it's all going to be good and rosy and peaches and cream? You're going to be raptured? God loves you. He don't want you to go through suffering. Well, the Bible tells us those who are of the righteous will have to go through suffering and persecution and affliction. Uh. Did not Christ, the Most High love Christ? Uh. Christ was his only begotten son, and yet Christ went through what? Suffering and affliction. And what did Christ say? The servant is not greater than his master. Know that if they hate you, that they hated me first. Uh -huh. So if you're a follower of Christ, understand, you're going to be hated, you're going to be persecuted, you're going to be afflicted, and eventually killed. Mm -hmm. Okay? If that be your, of course, your destiny or your lot, if that be the most size will. Okay? Read on. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Right. Now this is talking about people close to you. This is family. Mm who will now hate you because you've accepted Christ, they'll become offended, and now they will be the ones delivering you up to the persecutors, delivering you up to those in judgment seats to be killed and to be afflicted. Okay? Read on. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The love of many shall wax cold. Read on. But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Right. So he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Okay? So we understand that by this, we, we don't go by this understanding that you're saved. Or once saved, always saved. Mm. Christ says that he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. Mm -hmm. Okay? So we have to endure. Okay? Read on. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And this is the mission we're on now. Going throughout the four corners of the earth and preaching this gospel so that the end can be brought forward upon this earth. Okay? Now, the key thing we want to bring out in this particular scripture. As we stated earlier, the first thing that comes to mind when you hear of these things and you see these things come to pass, you begin to fear. Okay? But here's the question. Why did the Most High in Christ put these prophecies in Scripture? Why did he put them there? So we could be warned, so that we can prepare. What else? 
so we don't fear. Some of us think these prophecies are for us to now begin to fear. But it's the total opposite. Christ and the Most High have these prophecies and scriptures so that we don't fear. Now, how is that possible? How is telling you that famine is going to come upon the earth and war is going to come upon the earth? How is that going to make you feel good or make, you know, feel comfortable? Hmm. How is that possible? Well, because we have a loving God and an all-knowing, all-wise God, he tells us what happens before it happens. As it tells us, he declares the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So because he has that power, if he declared the end from the beginning, and I follow that God, then he's going to direct me from the beginning to the end. Ah. He has my best interest at hand. So if he's willing to warn me when these things come upon the earth, and I'm in his best favor, okay, I'm in his good graces, he will guide me through these things as they come. So this is why the Most High puts these things in the Bible, so that we can trust in him. Okay? You know, you can't trust in Amun Ra. Why? Because Amun Ra didn't prophesy anything. You can't trust in Buddha. Why? Because Buddha didn't prophesy anything. Okay? The only one you can trust in is the Most High. Okay? Uh, commentary? These signs are not there to make those who can see in the faith fearful. They are there to be utilized as boosters to your faith because it is by the word alone they were predicted. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Let's go to 2 Timothy 4 and 2. Read this, say, come. The book of 2 Timothy. Verse, chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Mm -hmm. So this is instruction that um, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul is giving to Timothy. Okay, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And he's going to explain why he's giving him this instruction. Verse 3, verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You must do these things because a time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Truth, Truth. Truth. Mm -hmm. correct doctrine. Who has the proper, correct doctrine? Christ. Okay? So people will not endure the sound, good doctrine of Christ. Read on. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And many of us have witnessed this in our lives and Many of us have seen others do this, and many of us have been a part of this ourselves. Okay? Back in the day, they had what you call fire and brimstone pastors. How many of you remember that term or ever heard of that term? Okay? Where everything is about you going to hell and, you know, so on and so forth. God is going to judge you. And, and it was a little bit on the edge. But nonetheless, the things that they were saying, some of those things were true. If you continue in this fashion, you are going to go to hell. Okay? So, a little bit after the fire and brimstone passes, they started bringing out what? The prosperity passes. The smooth passes. There is no hell passes. All right. All right? God is not going to judge those who we love. He's a loving God. Mm. You mean to tell me he's going to put you in hell to suffer forever? No, God don't want you to suffer. God is love. That's what they told you, right? Look at his picture. <laughs> Look at it. It points to a picture of Cedric. <laughs> Boys, yeah, with the, you know, like this with the heart, and he's just looking. And... <laughs> right. You think he's going to put you in hell to suffer? <laughs> Can't be. Mm. That's how they got us, right? Smooth things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who were in those fire and brimstone churches no longer wanted to hear that message. Why? Because there were certain things they were dealing with that they know if they continued in those things, 
Whatever those fire and brimstone pastors were doing, no matter how off sometimes they were or on edge they were, what they were saying was true about the Most High's judgment. Mm -hmm. So they didn't want to hear that. They wanted to hear God is love, which the Most High is love, but he's also a God of judgment. judgment. Okay? And he's loving enough to do what? To prepare us so that we don't have to go through that judgment. So warn us so that we don't have to go through that judgment. Okay? But that's just a small example of how people would rather hear smooth things, okay, in a prosperity church. God don't want you to be poor. God wants you to be rich. Look at me. God has blessed me. He has sanctified me. I've got the unction of the Holy Ghost and shakalaha ha ba 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 Right? That is. It gets you all into that, you know, that madness, that mess. And you're feeling good. Well, hey, if I serve God, that means I'm going to be rich. God going to bless me in due season and all this other stuff. If I sow a seed, uh -oh. I shall receive seed or increase, whatever they're talking about. Yeah. Cha-ching. Cha-ching. Now, in the Bible, sowing seed don't have anything to do with sowing money. God. Okay? In the Bible, the seed is what? The word. But because people want to hear smooth things... They, they don't want to, you show somebody that the seed is the word. No, you lie. My pastor said that the seed is sowing money. It's an offering. And if I sow the seed, I'm going to receive the increase. Mm. they rather believe that than the actual word of God itself. As the Bible says, the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay? And a lot of that, here's the next level. Because we're fearful of what's to come. We're constantly battling within ourselves from day to day. We're struggling. We're backsliding. To and fro, going back and forth. And we see the judgment. We see the writing on the wall. We see the prophecies coming to pass. And we say, man, this is too much for me to bear. I would rather someone prophesy unto me something smooth. Okay? Let me, you know what? Miss the brothers and sisters back at the uh, the old church. It's been a while. And mm -hmm. Maybe somebody in there, the most high, will be the share the truth with. Let me go back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? Yeah. Next thing you're in there, the pastor, you know, he's going through his thing. And next thing you know, you're sitting there and you're crying and he done put you back under the spell. Mm -hmm. Who in here want to be saved? I want to be saved. I want to be saved. Mm. Gotcha. But here it is. You know that he that shall endure until the end the same shall be saved. You know that. But because you want to hear smooth things, you're fearful. Lord, I want to be saved. This is another aspect of how that fear and that wavering of faith can even drive us back into falsehood or drive us back into the world. Okay? How many people, because they want to smoke weed, you know, they go to a place where it says it's okay to read the Bible and smoke weed. They understand me. Right. Mm -hmm. they, they understand what I'm going through. I like to get a little high. I get, yeah, I feel I'm a little bit more spiritual mm -hmm. when I'm high. Mm -hmm. You know, the Holy Spirit speaks to me when I'm high. Oh boy. Uh, ain't the Holy Spirit, bro. Oh boy. That's, that's a demon talking to you. Yes, sir. <laughs> He's sitting there, though, man. Yeah. Now the Holy Spirit that revealed to me, I can, I can fly. Yeah. Yeah. Let me go ahead and jump out this window real quick. Some extra smoke, some extra strength. Yeah, you, you got some. What's that stuff they call that? K2? <laughs> what they call it up here in the South? Y'all call it K2, right? That synthetic marijuana. Super got people going a little crazy and going running naked through the streets. Super dude. Right? Extra spiritual. Flocker. That's what they call it. Flocker. E extra spiritual. Yeah, you extra spiritual now. I can fly now. Yeah. I don't need to wear clothes now. I'm yeah. so spiritual. <laughs> but see, these are the things I know. It's it sounds strange to us, but these are the things people get involved with when they when they're taken away from the sound doctrine of Christ. Okay, when you fall for truth, you become susceptible to anything. Okay, so First Timothy or Second Timothy uh, four and three says what again? For the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heat to themselves teachers having itching ears. Having itching ears. 
So they'll find teachers that agree with their sin, their lust. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They shall turn their ears away from the truth. Read on. And shall be turned unto fables. And shall be turned to fables. Read on. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. Because sometimes it's affliction that causes us to now become fearful and start looking into other places. I don't want to have to go through that. Let me find another place that tells me I don't have to go through affliction. Mm -hmm. Let me go to a place that's going to tell me I'm going to be raptured before the Lord returns. Now, whether you believe it or not, it's still going to happen. It's still going to take place. So I'd rather be in a place that tells me the truth and prepares me for what to come. So when it happens, at least I know, at least I'm prepared. And I can make decisions accordingly. Okay? That's the mindset we should be in. But sometimes that fear is overwhelming. To the point where we will actually do this. We'll go somewhere that confers or, or confirms our fears. Okay? Read on. Verse 5. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Alright, read on. Uh, the commentary. That very time in which people would not endure sound doctrine is here. People these days choose doctrines based on what they are willing to accept and not really because the doctrine is sound. Those that look to be steadfast must stand on truth and endure the confusion and many challenges that may come because of not looking for the easy road like this self-serving world we live in. Mm -hmm. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6 and 19. You dare say con? The book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Mm -hmm. O Timothy, I read on. verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. So Paul is informing and instructing Timothy to keep what he received in his trust. Now, what did Paul give unto Timothy? The gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm. So he said, keep that which is committed, meaning the gospel, to your trust. Read on. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. And oppositions of science falsely so called. Hmm. Can you believe that there was a time, even here in America, where the majority of society had some level of Christian values and actually believed in the Bible in Christ, even though they may have believed in different doctrines and different sects and, and things of that nature, they still, to some degree, believed in Christ. Okay? Now, here comes this thing called science and enlightenment and, you know, you know the age of exploration and science, and now the science was used to now trump, or at least attempt to trump, the Bible, to now say that we no longer have to believe in the Bible because it's fables, it's fairy tales. There's a scientific explanation for everything. Hmm. Then they bring about this thing called, what, Darwinism, which now makes us believe that all life just happened by chance, <laughs> which we know that's utter foolishness. How can all of this love, all of this uh, intelligence, just us is quote unquote human beings is a testament that there was an all knowing God. We have wisdom and knowledge and able, are, are able to grow, then surely we were created by a knowledgeable being. Okay? No one goes into a forest and sees a watch with all the intricacies of a watch and say that, you know what? Just that watch created itself. <laughs> you know, all the cogs and all the hands and all the wheels, the straps, just came together and just created itself. Happen. Doesn't make sense, right? So how is it? We're greater than a watch. So how is it we just all of a sudden just came together and went, you know, we're a salamander and then we grew up into a monkey and from a monkey we became humans and all intelligence, so on and so forth? That's utter foolishness. Mm -hmm. But do you know what that doctrine did? For those who felt or that they had some type of variance against the Most High, 
because their aunt passed away when they were six years old. They prayed to God that, please don't take my aunt. And they still passed away, which is a sad thing. It's hard to bear. But because of that, they said, well, there must not be a God. God must not exist because I called upon him when my aunt was about to die and he didn't do anything. So what that doctrine did was it created a generation of people who felt they had God as their enemy. And it gave them an excuse to no longer believe in God. I no longer have to believe in God because God did not create me. In fact, how many of you have heard of this? God did not create man in his image. Man created God in his image. How many of you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. Utter foolishness. Okay? So this is an example of how science was used to turn us away from the Most High. And now, if I don't believe in God, there's no reason to believe in what? Judgment. If God did not create me, then I don't have to live by his standard. Okay? So that's another example of a smooth teaching, okay? Not enduring sound doctrine, okay? Read on. Verse 21. Which some professing having, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. So because many have professed to be scientists or professed to be philosophers of science, they have erred concerning the faith. Read on. Grace be with thee. Amen. Amen. Okay? Now, is there anything wrong with true science? Absolutely not, because true science will draw you to the conclusion that a God must God. exist. Right. In fact, you have scientists right now who are atheists and non-believers, and the more research they do in life, in biology, they come to the conclusion there's no way this could have happened by itself. It's impossible. Okay? These are men who, for the most of their life, in science, were starch atheists. Okay? But the scientific fact, or the so-called science that they have today, just cannot, it can't explain life as we know it. It's impossible. Okay? So it says, which some have been professed, meaning those who have professed science, have erred concerning the faith. Let's read the commentary. Too many have accepted the foolishness that science has come forth to provide their spin on reality. If their reality becomes our reality, then we will err in our faith and fall when the time to stand firm presents itself. We must build up a good foundation through studying the word diligently so that our spirits are ready for the challenges ahead. That's right. Because there's nothing in science that can prepare you for this time to come. Okay, when you see a demons manifesting themselves, what in science got you, you know, can prepare you for a demon coming out of nowhere and just manifesting itself? It's nothing. What in science can prepare you for spiritual warfare? Nothing. Okay, so you might as well build yourself a good foundation and get up in this good fight so that you can be prepared for the spiritual warfare to come. Okay, uh, let's go to Matthew 10 and 27. Were you there? Say come. The book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 27. <clears throat> what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. Mm -hmm. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the hot stops. Right, because at this time, Christ was only teaching certain things to his apostles. He would preach openly, but certain things, like the apostles asked him, why is it that you preach to them in parables, but when we're in secret, you give us the understanding. And Christ said that it's not for them to do what? To hear the mysteries of the kingdom of God. It is for you to know, to know these secrets, to know this understanding. Okay? So now that information that he was teaching his apostles, he was now saying, go out and proclaim openly to the world. Let the world know the things that I've taught you in secret. Okay? Read on. Verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Right, so the Bible says, fear not them which are able to kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. 
Because no man on this earth, no matter how mighty or how powerful, how influential, have no power over your soul. Okay? Your soul belongs to the Most High. Uh -huh. And He will do with your soul whatever He pleases. Man can do all types of things. He can torture. He can afflict. He can do pain. Okay? He can murder. But He has no power over your spirit. Okay? Read on. But so, so imagine having that type of mindset as you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. As you're walking through these neighborhoods and you're operating in these different scenarios. There's, there's nothing that can conquer that type of, you know. There's no fear in this earth that can conquer that boldness, that trust, that faith in the Most High. It is impossible. Okay? But we, we allow ourselves to look at man and respect man's person. That's when now the fear comes in. Man, he has a gun. He has the possibility to kill me. Or he's a governor. He has direction over my life. Or he has a judgment over my life, my physical life. That's when the fear kicks in. That's when we lose that boldness and that strength. Now, I'm not saying if someone has a gun to just go up and to them and say, man, you got a gun. I ain't worried about you, man. The most I got me. Boom. No, I'm not saying be stupid. <laughs> okay? <laughs> But I'm saying, if, if your life is in the balance, and someone is saying that, hey, whatever you do, I'm going to put you out, so be it. You ain't got no power over my soul. Right. Most high have mercy on you. You don't know what you're doing right now, brother. You don't know what you're doing, sister. Okay? I love you. Goodbye. Okay? Now, of course, if you can get yourself out of the situation, That'll be a little bit more. <laughs> That'll be more of a choice situation. All right? You know a little bit of something, you can, you know, get your way out of it. That'll be nice. Okay? But you know, there's some times, like uh, with Christ, there were times in which he got out of the situation. And there was a time when Christ knew, this is my time. It's, this is it. Peter tried to defend him and smite off the servant's ear. said, nah, put the ear back on. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right? Because Christ knew what? It was his time. No more, no more getting away. No more spinning out of the way and going somewhere else. It's time. Okay? And for us, that time will come where you know the most high is confirming. This is it. This is my time. Okay? So when that time comes, so be it. If it ain't your time, if you can get out that zone, get out that zone. Okay, don't let yourself become a victim and say that most of it will be done. No, get out of it. Okay? Where are we at? Verse 28, middle. Let's read on. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Mm -hmm. Are not two sparrows. Now think about that. Mm -hmm. He that is able to destroy both the body and, and soul, soul in hell. That's who you need to fear. God. No man on this earth has that power. Mm -mm. The Most High and Christ do have that power. So if that's the case, those are the people we must put our fear in. Okay? As it comes to judgment. All right? Because man can do, again, he can do all he wants to this, this flesh. But it's the spirit, as we often say, it's the spirit that fills. Once the spirit leaves your body, Someone can stab you. They can put your body on fire. Okay, they can throw you off a mountaintop. Your body won't react or do anything. But when your spirit goes into the place of habitation, for instance, if it goes to the bosom of Abraham and it deals with peace and profound quiet, you're going to feel that peace, that profound quiet. You're going to experience that. But if it's the Most High's will that you go into judgment and torments, you're going to feel that judgment and that torment. Okay? Letting you know, it's the spirit that fills. Okay? Read on. Verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them sh shall not fall on the ground without our, your father? Right. So two sparrows are sold for a farthing, meaning a very low price. And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father, meaning a person will not be able to kill a sparrow without the Most High's will or the Most High sanctioning the killing of that sparrow. Mm -hmm. 
So the question is, are you not greater than a sparrow that is sold for a farthing? Is your life not worth more than a sparrow? You're the image of the Most High God. So if that's the case, then the Most High values your life. And if the Most High values your life, what more should you value your life? Okay, and put your fear in the one that has power over your life, has power over your body and your soul. That's the one we must fear. Okay, read on. Verse 30. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. How many people ever tried to sit there in the mirror and count their hair? It's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. But the Most High, who is all knowing and all wise, can look at you. You got 134,000 hairs on your head. <laughs> okay? You got 2,000 hairs on your head. Oh, you're starting to recede a little bit. You're like, you got 500. Left with that thousand. Down to a hundred. All right, down to a hundred. All right. The most I know. Think about that power. Think about that might and that wisdom. Okay? So if he knows all of this, what more does he know about your life and your destiny? And if he has that knowledge of your life and your destiny, why not serve him? Okay? Not, why not look towards him or look for him to give you that information and that revelation on your life and your destiny? Why not let him guide you in his way? Okay? Or in your way. Okay? Read on. Verse 31. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more of more value than many sparrows. You are of more value than many sparrows. Okay? Now, for us, we may not be able to relate to sparrows. Probably, probably never even seen a sparrow in our life. But there are things we can relate to in this life that we put value on. Money, cars, houses, jewelry. So now let's put it in that phrase. You may buy yourself a Rolex watch. Now, me, I don't know how much a Rolex is. Never look, because I know I ain't got the money for a Rolex. <laughs> but you may be talking about 15000 20000 and up. Okay? Now think about it. A 15,000 watch. Many of us, we don't have 15,000 in the bank account. So to see something like that and to have the volume of something like that, we think, man, that is valuable. This must be more worth more than me because I don't possess the amount of money it takes to get a Rolex. Well, the most I says, no. You are more, worth more than that Rolex. You're, you're worth more than diamonds and rubies and precious jewels, you're worth more than that $1.5 million home. You're worth, you're worth more. Okay? So there's no volume that can be put on our life, on our soul. Why? Because there's no volume that can bring this body back. There's no volume, there's no amount of money that can bring your soul back from hell. Okay? So you're worth more than anything you can witness or see in this life, okay? And that brings a whole new level of understanding as to how sometimes we sell ourselves short. You have people who will sell their soul to get a Rolex. People that will sell their soul to get a $1.5 million house. People that will sell their soul to get a Mercedes Benz. Don't you know your soul is worth more? Take a soul. Okay? Mm -hmm. Your soul is worth much more than any form of substance you can get in this earth. Okay? The Most High tells us so. All right? Read on. Commentary. Yep, go ahead. Just as you breathe air every day and can't see it, we must remember that the Father is always there watching and protecting his people, whether we can see him or not. He it is who we should fear because there isn't a demon anywhere, nor a man who can kill us without his authority. Think of all of the horrible accidents that have occurred where a person should have definitely died, yet they survived. Science can't explain a lot of these situations and why a person didn't die, but it is as simple as because the Father did not say so. Exactly. Science can't prove these things or can't explain these things. Why do people pass away? In fact, what gives life? What is the source of life? They can't prove it. Why? Because they don't know. There's nothing in their science that can give them the knowledge 
of where life comes from. Okay? Even, and I'm not going to make this a science lesson, but even in the Big Bang, they say that there's a time in which there was a dot. Let me show you here. Let me, let me show you where the world came from according to science. Mm -hmm. You got a piece of paper? Mm -hmm. All right, now, science. Huh? At one point in time, 20 billion years ago, 15 to 20 billion years ago, the world was just a small dot sitting in space. And keep in mind, space did not exist because space is a product of the quote-unquote Big Bang. So they can't explain how is something sitting in space when space don't exist yet. Okay? Nonetheless, you got a small dot sitting in space, and all of a sudden, boom! No. <laughs> Big bang. And now, all of a sudden, you get, you know, rocks are flowing in space, and all these things are going around. Rocks are colliding, and they're hitting one another, and it's creating energy, and that energy is now bringing forth different elements, and those elements are now moving around in circles and doing all these great things, and all of a sudden, boom! We have life. Where? Who let the dot? Where did the dot come from? Well, well, that's the point. Oh. We can't prove where the dot came from. Hmm. We don't know who caused the dot to explode. Or who lit it. Or who lit it. Hmm. We don't know. All we know it was a dot that exploded. And boom, here we are. <laughs> Some of that spiritual marijuana again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And hey, I'm glad you mentioned that because don't you know a lot of these so-called wise men and scientists were drug addicts? Yes. Don't you know that these men like uh, uh, Steve Jobs, okay, he's a, a tech guy, right? Don't you know he was an LSD head or a user, abuser of LSD? Don't you know these guys, Sigmund Freud and all these guys that are recognized for psychology and science, so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. He was a drug, he was a coke head. Albert Einstein, one of the most noticeable, celebrated scientists on the face of this earth, a cokehead, LSD head. So these guys were getting high and then coming up with these, <laughs> these wild theories. <sighs> what if the world really came from a dot? <laughs> and the dot exploded. I think I can see it. No, no, no. It exploded. Okay. It exploded and... After it exploded, it all went in circles. No, it went into a rectangle, no, a triangle. A triangle. A triangle caused the rocks to collide and, you know, it became a cosmic soup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These guys were getting high, man. Totally. And we're sitting there. You got people now paying millions or, or hundreds of thousands of dollars going through these universities to listen to theories that came from drug addicts. Tell me, how many of you would pay $100,000 to go sit at the feet of a a crackhead asking, how did life come to be? <laughs> Raise your hand if you would do so. Believe it or not, people are doing it now. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, if you paid a crackhead five dollars, I, I bet you he can tell you many things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got a dot. I see all the dots. He, he can tell you many things about dots and all kinds of stuff. He revealed the things you never knew in your life mm -hmm. for five dollars. Okay. <laughs> You're better off doing that than going to one of these universities and, and putting yourself in debt to learn this foolishness. Okay? And we say that because this foolishness that is respected in the earth today can't even tell us where we came from and how we came to be. What is the life source? What happens to that life source, that spirit, after it leaves the body? You can't explain none of that. And it's a shame that many of these men don't find out the reality of what happens until after they're already gone. Hmm. You think the Most High don't exist? As it said about that rich man in Luke 16, in hell he lifted up his eyes. And he realized how real the Most High was at that point. That's right. Okay? So that has been the fate of many of these men claiming to be scientists. Okay? Now getting back into it, uh, we're... Yeah, we're getting short on time, so I'm going to try to speed through. Uh, Colossians 3 and 1. Let's see, we're actually almost finished here. In fact, we have quite a few things here. We're, we're going to go through as, as much as we can within the time frame before we uh, wrap it up. 
The book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 1. When you there, say come. come. Colossians, chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Most High. Mm -hmm. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Mm -hmm. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with the Christ in the most high power. Right. So this is what allows us to shape that fear and that wavering. When we realize that we're dead already, that puts a whole new level of boldness within us to be able to stand against all that this world puts in front of us. To stand against all that Satan tries to put in front of us. It's because we think we still have a life in this world that keeps us in fear. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. That puts you in bondage of fear. Mm -hmm. When you realize that you've lost everything already, you're dead already, like, okay, most sides will be done. Next. Hmm. Okay. Now, again, I'm not saying be careless, okay, about your life. What I'm saying is that when you, when you have that knowledge, that when you went to that water, and we have a, again, most high be praised, we have a family who was baptized today. Yay. Okay. When you, when you have, when you go to that water and you make that covenant with the Father yes. to say that, Lord, today I die yes. in this water and I'll come out with newness of life to serve you in righteousness and truth, mm -hmm. who then can put you in fear? So that, that Leon, he's in the water. He's already dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, Deshaun, he's in the water. Veronica is in the water. What more can you do to me? Right. You have no power over me. Now, Veronica, you may have had a little bit of power over Veronica. You had power over Deshaun. You had power over Leon. But you ain't got no power over me. Okay? Because now, Christ lives through me. And you surely ain't got no power over Christ. He proved it. You crucified him. You left him on that cross. And three days later, he did what? He resurrected. The Roman soldiers, they look, they sitting there confused. Man, that, that, that rock that we put before his tomb... It's impossible for one man to move that thing out the way. But yet, we went back to the tomb, and it was moved. They going around searching, and, you know, the Jews, and their wickedness, our, four, you know, our forefathers and their evil, they said, well, look, this is what we'll do, right? I got the whole rundown, right? These people believe in Christ, right? And even more will believe in Christ if they know that he resurrected from the dead three days later. This is what we'll do. We'll say that his disciples came and they moved the rock and they took his body and stole it and put it somewhere else. Aha! Uh -huh. yeah, got a way out now. Now, we can just, that can be the lie we tell to the rest of the earth going forward. Mm -hmm. Christ didn't resurrect, his disciples stole his body. That's not the story we have. Hold up. We got the true story through God's word. Oh, right. The true story is that he was. In the belly of the earth, Salakia, three days and three nights, he resurrected, showed himself of many, for many days, and then he what? Went up to the Father. Now he's on the Most High's right hand. So he proved that you have no power over him. So if he's in me, then you surely ain't got no power over me. Okay? So that's the boldness we must have with the truth of Christ. And I'm going to say this. As much as we glory and we love the knowledge of who we are, being Israelites, it opens up the Bible to so much understanding that before we just couldn't, we couldn't see it, we couldn't understand it because we couldn't relate to the people in the Bible. But now that we're able to relate, our spirit is in it. Our joy is in it. To be able to say that Abraham is your father, Sarah is your mother. Do you know how powerful that is? Okay? And those are beautiful things. Amen. But brothers and sisters, it comes a time in his walk and his knowledge where just knowing who you are is not enough. You get to that point where you're like, okay, I know who I am, but what is my purpose? What must I do to enter into life? And when that question starts to come about, then you found yourself entering some truth. Because you're going to find out some things about the Most High, 
You're going to find out some things about yourself that you must deal with in order to meet the Most High one day and for him to receive you as his son. Because we're all going to meet the Most High. But the reality is that all of us are not going to meet the Most High with a, you know, he's not going to have a smile on his face for many people. As it says, the time will come when many will be resurrected, some unto everlasting life and others into eternal damnation. So we'll all see the Father. The question is, what side of the Father will we see? You're going to see his good side? Son, job well done. Or will you see the other side? Those who come and say, Lord, Lord. And he says to you, get thee away from me, ye worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Now that, I'm, I'm afraid of that. God. Okay? What man can do, man can, he can't do nothing. He, he has that, you don't have that power. Man can't tell me where I'm going to go after I die or what have you. or have control over where I'm going to go when I die. But Christ does. <laughs> and if he tells you, get thee away from me, ye worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Boy, oh boy, that's something to keep you up at night. That's something to keep you tossing and turning. All right? So those are the things that we, you know, we meditate on as we grow and we develop in the truth after we receive the knowledge of being an Israelite. What's next? Am I pleasing unto the Father? Am I one of those wicked scribes and Pharisee Israelites that the Most High in Christ were not pleased with? Or am I one of Christ's disciples? Right. One of those who follow Christ that he is pleased with? Mm -hmm. And that's the type of Israelite Christ is looking for, that the Most High is looking for. If his son be not in you, there's only one other master. Okay? And that's Lucifer. Mm -hmm. The son of disobedience. All right? Let's uh, continue on here in the verse number what? Four. Verse four. You know? Colossians chapter three, verse four. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mm -hmm. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of the Most High cometh on the children of disobedience. Mm -hmm. In which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Right, so these are the things that we must do that are necessary for us to enter into life. Putting off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy communication out of our mouths. Read on. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Right. Now that sounds easy, right? Sounds easy enough, but to put these things in application, that's where the trouble starts. Mm -hmm. That's when we find ourselves falling short. Okay? So we have to find ways to reaffirm what the Most High requires of us, to reaffirm not being in the spirit of anger, not using filthy communication and profanity. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we reaffirm it? Well, the scripture says to meditate on his law. In fact, let's get that, Joshua uh, 1 and 8. Okay? So I want you all to remember this reference. When you fall, when you find yourself you getting to that place, which is not pleasing to the Father, okay? Get that, and uh, also, in fact, let's let's get that for now. Okay, uh, Joshua, I believe it's one and eight. Mm -hmm. Book of Joshua, chapter one, verse eight. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Right. So it says, the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. So the question is, what does that meditation do? What it does is that when these situations come about, it brings the scriptures to your remembrance. Mm -hmm. Usually when we get in these bad situations, when we're going off the deep end, we allow man or we allow that, that fleshly nature to kick in. 
And that flesh, that fleshly nature is what drives us to make our decision in those key moments. Okay? You get in an argument, what's the first thing the man, the fleshly man want to say? You gotta say something to make this person hurt. Let them know how you feel. Mm -hmm. Make them feel the pain that they've made you feel. Mm -hmm. That's the natural man. God. Okay? The spiritual man is able to withdraw himself. The spiritual man is able to keep himself from saying something he'll regret later. God. Okay? That's the spiritual man. So then, when you get in those moments, when you see things are going off the deep end, scriptures will now come into your mind. Not what you have to say to make this person feel pain and hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay? Let not filthy communication come out of your mouth. You'll pause yourself. Hold mm -hmm. on. I'm about to say something that's filthy. I'm about to say something that's going to destroy our relationship from this day going forward. Mm -hmm. Let me step back. Let me go pray to the Most High. Lord, Heavenly Father, can you please give me the strength to overcome this situation? There's a lot of things in my heart right now and on my mind that, you know, I feel pain, I feel hurt. Mm -hmm. And the only way that my, my flesh feels that I can overcome is if I make the other person feel pain and hurt and make them feel the way I feel. So, Lord, please give me the strength to overcome. All right? So you go into that prayer, what they call the prayer closet. All right? And these are the things which reaffirm the word of the Most High, reaffirm the practices that the Most High, the commandments that the Most High give us on how to deal in these situations. Okay? Read on. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse 9. Mm -hmm. Have not I so it says, through meditating and, and keeping the commandments, you shall have good success. Okay, so success is not measured. Of course, it's good to have wealth and things of that nature, and the Most High can bless you with those things. I'm not saying that wealth is of Satan. The Most High can bless you with wealth. The way he blessed Abraham with wealth. He blessed Job with wealth. He blessed Solomon with wealth. Okay? It's not evil. But success is not measured by those things. Mm -hmm. Success is measured by how you keep the Most High's commandments. Because he says what? The whole duty of man is what? To fear God and keep his commandments. That's our whole duty. Mm -hmm. All right? Let's get back to Colossians, the third chapter. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. Verse 9, Salakia. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Okay. Let's jump over to the book. Let's see here. Let's close out here. Let's see what we will end this here with. All right. Let's end this with um, Psalm sixty-eight and, and uh, nineteen. Right, there's a lot more information we can cover, but for the sake of time, I'm going to conclude here, and then we're going to finish off the rest of the service with a performance from the choir, and we'll also make some announcements. Psalms 68, verse 19. Book of Psalms, chapter 68, verse 19, when you there say, come. <clears throat> verse 19. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the most high of our salvation. Selah. He that is our most high power is the most high power of salvation, and unto the most high power the Lord 
belong the issues from death. But the Most High shall read that again. He that is our power is the Most High of salvation. Right. So he that is our God is the God of salvation. No other God that's worshipped in this earth possesses that power. Meaning no other God, Amin Ra, Buddha, Hare Krishna. Okay? With some of the other gods they have out here on the earth that they're worshiping. Allah. Allah has no power of salvation. In fact, Allah, if you want to see Allah, you can go outside right now and I can show you a rock. And you ask me, can that rock give you salvation? And you'll say, surely not. Because it's a rock. <laughs> Rocks have no power. No. And a rock surely cannot grant me salvation. The only God who has that power is our God. So we should have boldness in that. We should have faith in that. We should be strengthened by that concept. Mm -hmm. Read on. And unto the Most High, the Lord, belong the issues from death. And unto him belongeth the issues of death. So Allah is not the one who says, it's his time. He must now go. Buddha is not the one that says, it's his time to go. His little fat self, OP self, <laughs> sitting there in legs crossed, you know, foolishness. Okay? KFC will do it to you. Yeah, yeah, KFC. It must have been KFC back when Buddha was walking in Europe. All right? Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you know, in all seriousness, Con. Buddha does not possess that power. Not at all. Okay? All these other gods don't possess this power. Only the Most High does. Mm -hmm. Okay? Read on. Verse 21. But the Most High Ahaya shall wound and the, the head of his enemies. The Most High shall wound the head of his enemies. Read on. And the hairy scalp of such an one as goeth on steel in his trespasses. That's right. So I'm going to close out with the commentary. Be strong in the faith and don't doubt the Father. Become steadfast through diligence and be thankful every day for the things he has given you already. Shalom. Shalom. At this time, if we have anyone who is here for the first time who would like to um, introduce themselves, uh, you please can. If not, then that's fine. All right. How you doing, sister? All right. Let's uh, let's get her a microphone. Shalom, Shalom sister. sister. All right. Hello, my name is Tyler. This is my cousin, Maya. Okay, Shalom. Shalom. Welcome to the body. Okay. All right, so this is you guys' first time here. Have you been learning online? Uh, yes, we have. All right, that's wonderful. Welcome to the fold. Welcome. So we're going to be seeing you guys more after that. All right, that's good. Oh, okay. All right. So you've been here before, right? That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let's get the young lady here standing up. Mm -hmm. You can introduce yourself, young lady. My name is Charlie Pyatt, and I have certainly been inspired by the message that I heard today. Well, all praises to the Father. So let's give the Father a lot of applause. Anyone else? If not, you you know we're fine. We're not going to force anyone to. Okay, we got one more. Okay. Shalom, shalom, everyone. Shalom. Uh, my name is Eliyahu Hakanan. Uh, okay. My cousin goes here, right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm new to um, the area. I'm from um, Jersey. 
Excuse me. Uh, I hate talking. <laughs> All right, brother, that's fine. Um, yeah, I'm new here from the area. Um, I've been to um, when um, Elder Vicar was in Philadelphia. Still, I used to sit on the um, on the block with them back in the day. Okay. And um, he used to sit out there in front of the gallery, and um, you know, he used to sit out there busting with them back in the, you know, back in my Philly days. <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> But um, it's it's a blessing to be here today. Um, you know, actually, me and me and my cousin hadn't even met each other, um, which is really interesting because I didn't know he was a Hebrew. Wow. And um, we, our family is a super huge family. So I'm from the north, and he's from Florida. I used to live down there with him, but um, he's a lot younger than me. And um, you know. We're like some of the only, I think we're the, probably one of the only two that's in our family that, you know, runs through the truth, at least on this side of my family. On my father's side of the family, they're all Levites. So okay. for our history, historical accuracy, I think seven, seven or eight generations back, my great, 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 yeah, grandparents were Moshe and Lula Levi. Okay. Um, our family originally came here from Algeria and all the way from Israel. So we have a long, long history when it comes down to it. Um, which is the reason why like the brothers asked me today, why do I cover my head? Because I'm Levi. Okay. But, um, you know, it's excellent to be in the house, you know, of the Most High always. And to be in the fellowship with others, you know, who have a strong belief in the spirit. You know, who follow the Ruach HaKodesh just as well. You know, and to be, you know, like they asked me today, to be in one accord in the spirit. So as much as the, um, I was late, I'm sorry. I had a little it's fine, but, it's fine. but um, I was listening while I was in the um, hallway, and it was excellent to you know to still to hear, you know that the word is coming truth into all people, and that we are growing and we continue to grow, and we you know we continue to um, admonish the Most High, and to be servants unto Him in all things that we do. So you know, I would admonish everyone here to continue in your walks, continue in the works that you do. Because we are the light and we are the salt of the earth. The more that we continue to do what we do, the more that others will see us and they will continue to come to us because we are shining, you know, through the light of Christ in all things that we do. So it's excellent to be here. I hope I see y'all again. I only live right around the corner, actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm living on Flint River over here. So um, it will be excellent to see y'all once again. You know, I won't be just like this. This was just me running out the house. <laughs> but um, Okay. It's just truly a blessing. You know, I'll get to meet all of y'all and talk to y'all later over the course of time. Thank you. All right. Bless you. All right. So that's it? All right. So uh, at this time, we will uh, make a few announcements. Then afterwards, we'll give the choir their second performance. We'll also take up a collection offering. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. All right. So, Holy Days, Feast of Tabernacles. It'll be here before you know it. Make sure you schedule off work September 22nd through September 30th. And please sign up in the front if you plan to attend and indicate whether you'll be attending the entire eight days, the first four days, or the last four days. In preparation, you can expect for the cost to be $32 per site per day, and each site has availability for two tents. The max is eight people and three cars for each site. It's important for us to have a proper head count so that we can make sure we have food and everything else. If you need a letter for work absence, you can select that option on the sign-up sheet. Baptisms. If you're interested in baptisms, there's a sign-up sheet out front. Please include complete information, including your email address. And Hebrew and Bible Academy. We are still accepting enrollments. It started June 24th. You can enroll and make payments directly online at historytimes.org. If you're seeking to receive marriage counseling or courting procedures, please see Brother Baruch. 
and dress code. Brothers and sisters, please remember to wear modest attire. Sisters, remember to wear head wraps in the sanctuary. We ask that you wear loose fitting dresses or skirts. Brothers, please wear a white or light colored button down or polo shirt. Avoid wearing sagging pants. And if you have any questions, you can speak to the front desk or church officials. And lastly, housekeeping. Please keep in mind that we are to be outside of this location by 4 p.m. So we're asking that everyone is mindful to clean up your respective areas. Duwada. All right, at this time, we're going to have the choir come up to perform their second selection. Okay, also, when the choir comes up, we can have the officers come and um, go around for the collection. As far as collection goes, brothers and sisters, uh, we know that everyone's preparing for tabernacles and whatnot. We're also preparing at the same time for the memorial blowing of the trumpets, our feast. Okay, so what we want to do and ask for um, as we're building up to that, we're going to ask that um, uh, individuals that are attending the uh, memorial blowing of the trumpets for our feast, that uh, if you would... Uh, Donate 20 for individuals and $40 for families. Okay, that's what we're asking for. It's not due up front today or anything of that nature, uh, but that is what we're asking for as we're preparing ourselves to bring forth, um, set up all of these uh, scenarios and the, the events and ventures, okay? So that's where we're working at, all right? Here's another microphone, family. This is the time when we get up and we let the fruit of our voice give praise to the Most High. Thank <laughs> you. 
What a beautiful selection. Let's give another round of applause for the choir. Right, because we definitely do glorify the name of a higher shot higher. Okay. At this time, we're going to perform our prayers. So if you can all rise for our prayers. First and foremost, we're going to do the personal prayers for those who have prayer requests. Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, Sister Irene and family, Sister Irene and family, Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, Sister Francina, Sister Francina, and family, and family. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, Sister Regina, Sister Regina, and family, and family. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, Ashley, Ashley, and family, and family. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, Leon, Leon, and family, and family. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, Sister Stephanie Gunn. Sister Stephanie God. May you bless them. May you bless them. May you heal them. May you heal them. May you protect them. May you protect them. In the name of your son Yeshaya. In the name of your son Yeshaya. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. In your name. In your name. We say. We say. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll just pray for the congregation and the nation. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, the body of Christ, the body of Christ. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, the sick. The sick. Ahaya. Ahaya. Bahasham. Bahasham. Yeshaya. Yeshaya. Barak. Barak. Rapa. Rapa. The homeless. The homeless. Ahaya. Ahaya. Bahasham. Bahasham. Yeshaya. Yeshaya. Barak. Barak. Rapa. Rapa. The fatherless. The fatherless. Ahaya. Ahaya. Bahasham. Bahasham. Yeshaya. Yeshaya. Barak. Barak. Rapa. Rapa. The widows. The widows. Ahaya. Ahaya. Bahasham. Bahasham. Yeshaya. Yeshaya. Barak. Barak. Rapa. Rapa. The wrongfully imprisoned. The wrongfully imprisoned. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahasham, Bahasham, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, Barak, Barak, Rapa, Rapa, the nations, the nations that seek your holy name, that seek your holy name. In the name of your son Yeshaya, we thank you. In the name of the son Yeshaya, we thank you. The water, the water, Aman, Aman. All right. I understand that the choir will perform the Shema and the closing prayer in Hebrew. So. Uh, we can have the choir come up and do that. And uh, one, one thing, let me mention one thing before you start. Okay. Uh, just to be clear, for those who may be here for the first time, uh, what we were just reciting, um, is Ahaya, it's the name of the Mosai, Bahashem, which in Hebrew means in the name, um, Yeshaya, which is the name of Christ, Wa, which means and, Rewa, which is the Holy Spirit, Barak, Rapa, means bless and heal. Okay? So I'll make that clear so we're not barbarians uh, to you who are listening. Okay? And uh, you can proceed. Uh, the Shema and the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew.
translate the Lord's Prayer into English, which you just heard was the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew. So we'll just translate into English. Ahaya, Ahaya, Bahashem, Bahashem, Yeshaya, Yeshaya, our Father, our Father, which art in heaven, which are in heaven, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy will be done, in earth, in earth, as it is in heaven, as it is in heaven, give us this day, give us this day, our daily bread, our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, as we forgive our debts, and lead us not to temptation, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the power, and the glory, and the glory, forever, forever, Amen. Amen. speak in the office uh, afterwards, okay? And also we're going to be in the office for a little bit, so if there's any requests, counsels, anything that needs to take place, you can line up and see us at the office. Um, other than that, the service has concluded, so if you need to... Oh, offers. We haven't done offers. Okay, I thought you guys were going to offers. Okay, let's do the offers first, and then we will conclude. All right, brothers and sisters, thank you for all that you provide and help us to facilitate and help us to keep a place of worship, to keep a sanctuary. So all that you can, every little bit is appreciated. A lot of. No, 
was not succeeding last week because there's two people, two sites that can be camped on. So 16 is splitting a site. You only get a whole site to yourself. And there, these sites are big enough. Two families, easy, eight people. And you split the 